Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. A warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today for this virtual academic program on national security such development and implementation in Africa. My name is Luca Byung Deng Kual. I am the academic dean at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and the faculty lead of this program on national security strategy development and implementation in Africa. And I will be moderating this session. I would like to begin our program by brief remarks from Kate Knopf, the director of the Africa Center. All of you, you have her bio, but let me just highlight some few of her relevant experiences. Kate has served as the director of the Africa Center since 2014. Uh, she held several senior positions at the US Agency for International Development, including assistant administrator for Africa and a mission director for Sudan, Sudan and, and Northern Sudan and Southern Sudan, and deputy assistant administrator for Africa. Uh, Ms. Ms. Knopf holds an MA and BA from John Hopkins University. So, Kate, you are most welcome. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Luca, and uh, good day uh, to all of our participants. Uh, we are expecting more than 80 participants across uh, so many countries uh, on the continent. Uh, and it is a real pleasure uh, to welcome you to this Africa Center for Strategic Studies program. Uh, we're uh, equally delighted uh, to have uh, colleagues uh, returning uh, with us uh, from national security strategy development uh, programs that we've conducted previously. So uh, welcome back uh, to all of our alumni and uh, to all of our new colleagues uh, joining us today. The Africa Center for Strategic Studies, uh, uh, slide please, uh, Matilda. Uh, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies serves as a forum for research, for academic programs, and for the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a Department of Defense Regional Center located at the National Defense University in Washington, DC. We carry out our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Next slide, please. Accordingly, we seek to generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to dynamic and complex security challenges. We recognize that addressing serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges. And so the Africa Center provides opportunities for partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. By engaging with our African partners, military and civilian, governmental and civil society, as well as national and regional, we hope to reinforce that we all have valuable roles to play in mitigating the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. This kind of dialogue infused with real world experiences and fresh analysis, we hope provides an opportunity for continued learning and catalyzes concrete actions. And you can see on this slide some of the themes that we touch on you know, in the Africa Center programs uh, and on the website in the program link you know, that is posted in the chat line, you will find more information on the Africa Center and the slides in all of the languages in which the program is being conducted today. Next slide, please. Finally, we hope that you will stay engaged with us uh, uh, even after we finish uh, our couple of weeks uh, together over the course of this discussion on national security strategy development process. Uh, and we do this uh, through our LinkedIn group uh, for the alumni uh, that you can see here. Uh, we do this uh, through uh, all of our products uh, and resources on the website. Uh, and we hope that you will stay in touch uh, with our alumni affairs colleagues uh, and also 
Uh, we will connect you to the other alumni in your countries after this program ends. So thank you once again. Uh, slides down, please. Thank you once again for joining us uh, for this uh, discussion and program on national security strategy development. Uh, we very much hope that uh, we will be a trusted platform for this uh, conversation, uh, that all of our understanding will be expanded, that we will make some new relationships, uh, and most importantly, that we will catalyze some strategic solutions together. Dr. Luca, back to you. Yeah, yeah, Kate, uh, thank you very much. And I think the main objective as Kate mentioned from our mission is whether we should be able with this webinar, I mean, with this uh, um, seminar to create a trusted platform, but also to know each other and whether you can be able to go back with some tools and concept that can help you wherever you are to become an agent of change in your country. Um, but let me start first to give you an overall view of this program of national security strategy development and implementation in Africa. This program is divided into three rounds, with each round having three sessions. The first round focused on the national security strategy in Africa, and especially emphasizing the issue of context, concepts, rationale, and commitment, and the process. Round two, which is of today, is the national security side development uh, process in case of lessons learned. And round three uh, will focus on the implementation of the national security strategy. The main objective of this program is to provide you with a trusted platform, as Kate mentioned, with which you will be comfortable for candid experience sharing and peer learning about development and implementation of national security strategies. We hope by the end of this program to provide you with the necessary concepts and tools for developing national security strategies and some approaches for engineering political will for such a process. This virtual academic program is divided into moderated plenary session, like what we are, I'm going to moderate now, and then followed by discussion group discussion in the, uh, in the following day. Discussion group session is the real workshop where you will be, where you will have an ample time to share candidly your experience and it will be moderated by experienced uh, facilitators. Because for, for the sake of some of you who did not attend the first, the first round, let me just give some of the highlights. Those who attended round one of the national security such development and implementation, they came from countries that did not attend the sub-regional workshop uh, on the national security side development in Africa, or did not start the process of initiating the national security such development process. And the objective of that round focus clearly on how to clarify key concepts, understand the context, gender mainstreaming in security sector, and the rationale for the national security strategy development process. And we discuss also the national security strategy development toolkit as a practical tool to guide the countries to develop the national security strategies. We discuss also uh, the, uh, the AU and and, and United Nations support and commitment to support their member state in drafting their national security strategies. And we discuss as well the challenges during the national security side development process. But let me, for the sake of those who did not attend, let me just share with you some of the key takeaways. One key takeaway and one is understanding and diagnosing the context. A clear statement of a problem is a key pathway to finding effective solution. What you often see in some countries on our continent is the dominant solution driven approach, resulting in cut and paste prescription that are often alien and unfit to address complex security challenges facing Africa. Effective response to the complex security challenge in Africa 
requires a problem-driven approach. The second takeaway is the understanding of security. And this concept is very important wherever you want to embark on developing national security strategy. The concept of security is best understood in terms of human security as people's centric concept rather than a state centric. The human security as adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in 2012 is defined as a freedom from one, freedom from fear, with seven of essential dimension, uh, dimension, dimensions, economic security, food security, health security, environmental security, personal security, community security, and political security. From this inclusive definition of human security makes the human security rather than the state security as a national security. Third, the concept of national security policy and national security strategy. National security policy provides a vision by setting priority and goals is a roadmap of how to deliver security to the citizen. National security strategy is a plan of action for the implementation of the national security policy. What matters is not the naming of the document, but the content of the document, as some countries adopted first security policy and then develop security strategy or combine the two into one document known as national security strategy. But I would like to highlight one point also. We have what is called sectorial security strategies, such as defense white paper or defense strategies. These are subsidiary strategies developed to address a specific threats to national security. And their formulation is guided and informed by national security strategy. Third, is it important to have national security strategy in Africa? United Nations provides a detailed list of rationale for the national security strategy, including providing opportunity for forging a new social contract between governments and the people. It is a powerful national communication tool to allay fears of neighbors and build good neighboring relations. However, the process of national security strategy development is more important than the document itself because such a process provides a solid basis for inclusive national conversation and dialogue of how security to be managed and delivered to the citizen. There's a wealth of evidence that shows a well-designed and inclusive process of developing national security strategy enable decision makers to combat better the security threats and improve effective delivery of security to the citizen. And then the question, then what, if it is so important, what is the status of security strategy in Africa? Despite the call by the African Union since 2004 for its member state to develop their national security strategies through inclusive and participatory process, there's a dearth of such strategies on the continent. In instead, most African countries continue with traditional and state-centric approach to security. And in most cases, regime security, regime-centric security uh, approach. That is largely guided by the defense policies or defense white papers, which focus on delivering security to the state or regime security rather than the citizen. This death of national security strategy on the continent is largely attributed to lack of political will and absence of, an absence of practical tool for national security strategy development. Last, then the question, how can we develop national security strategy? Since 2017, the Africa Center has been socializing the national security concept uh, through multinational and sub-regional uh, academic programs that covered most of the African countries. This culminated in developing 
a practical national security site development tool that provides seven phases for the process. First, the first phase is initiation and planning. The second phase is pre-drafting, uh, including assessment, audit, and review and analysis. The third phase is drafting itself. And the fourth phase, consultation and review. And fifth phase, adoption and approval. And sixth phase is dissemination and communication. And the last phase is implementation, monitoring, and review. These phases will be the focus of round two of the National Security Site Development Africa, with the National Security Toolkit as the main reading material. And I see we are referring to you this uh, in the reading material will be the National Security Site Development Toolkit, uh, and then the case studies. And please, you refer to them because these are the main source for our, for this session, on phase one and phase two, we have simply four objectives. First, to share some typical phases of the national security development process in Africa. And second, to discuss the critical entry points and conditions that trigger the initiation of the national security strategy development uh, uh, process. And third, to examine some pre-drafting action that are necessary for the inception of the national security strategy development process. And lastly, but not least, to share some of the critical lessons learned during the initiation and inception of the national security strategy development process. The plenary discussion uh, will be for about 40 minutes and then followed by a question and answer session for about 25 minutes. Uh, let me now introduce to you our panelists. I am pleased to welcome three outstanding and seasoned experts and practitioners. These are people going to share with you with the practical experience, no theorization, practical, how did they do it uh, on the national security uh, development? And they will help us to start our conversation about the practical process of the national security study development. As you have their bios, I will highlight some relevant aspects of their experience and expertise. Let me start with Colonel uh, John uh, Biagi. He is a special advisor to the Director General of National Center for Strategic and Security Studies, abbreviated as SHETS of Senegal. He is the head of the Defense, Security, and Peace uh, Master Program at, the, at SHETS. He's a career and professional and experienced military officer. He was the head of division in the director of legislative control and legal advisor to the minister of the armed forces. He participated in the drafting of various strategies in Senegal. He holds a doctorate in public law and a master of arts in defense from King's College London. Thank you very much, Colonel Biagi, for being with us today. Second panelist is Ambassador Mamadou Badji. Uh, Badji, Ambassador Badji, he is the National Security Advisor to the President of the Republic of the Gambia. He served as ambassador in many countries. He served as well as Deputy Chief of Staff of the Gambia Armed Forces. He also served as contingent commander of the United Nations mission in Sierra Leone. He, he received multiple awards, including Distinguished Service Medals of the Republic of the Gambia and the National Order Rang of, the, of Member of the United Nations Medal uh, for, the, his, for the mission in Sierra Leone. Um, Ambassador Badi also is a member of the Forum of West Africa National Security Advisors uh, forum. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador uh, Badji, for being with us. The last but not least is the discussion, uh, fairly sharply. Uh, she's an independent expert in conflict and security and reviewed our toolkit, the National Security Site Development uh, Toolkit. Uh, she is a rostered uh, expert for the International Security Sector Advisory Team and she worked at the Geneva Center for Security Sector, known as DCAV, a world-leading center in security governance. 
Uh, she holds a master program from the Geneva Graduate Institute and a doctorate from uh, Otto Soher Institute of Political Science at the Pire University of Berlin. Uh, Felix, thank you very much for being with us. Let me start our conversation first with uh, Colonel uh, Biagi. Uh, Biagi, I know you have been engaged, direct engagement in the process of drafting national security strategy for Senegal. Uh, can you share with the participants how the process is started and who initiated it and why leadership matters in initiating the process? Can you as well share with the participants the first step that were taken, including review of security sector, formation of drafting committee, and plan of action for the national security strategy development. Um, Colonel, you have about uh, five to six minutes for this question. You are most welcome, please. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Luca. Thank you very much, Dr. Luca, for your Thank invitation. Thank you very much, and Dr. Luca. Good morning, Luca. good afternoon. And thank to you all very the much for all the panelists. Uh, the question so to that answer I the asked, question that you asked me about the process in Senegal, I can say, first of all, that the process started after several attempts to develop strategies. And we had had several different attempts in the past. The last one was in 2014, and that was the concept of national security strategy and defense by the uh, uh, by the Ministry of Defense. And then we adopted the architecture for defense, uh, for the defense of secu uh, the security of Senegal. And then we noticed that there were some weaknesses in these processes. And this was because these approaches were purely military based. We were focusing only on defense. And so in order to be able to be uh, in, conf in compliance with our agreements, our defense agreements with France, but the concept of defense, the objective for this was to reform all of our all of our military organization and security and defense forces so that we could be more in line with the geopolitical situation in Senegal. So this process was very limited in terms of its content. There was an updating of the concept of defense. You had to take into account the overall defense by involving the ministries in the efforts for defending the nation. Now, in terms of the stakeholders, the drafting committee only included the representatives of security forces, uh, representatives from the ministries of health, environment, ministry for youth, and this representation only involved certain ministries in these efforts of defense. All other ministries were left out, as well as other government entities. In the terms of the legal aspect, um, there was a presidential intervention. It was not a law. It was not a decree. So the extent of influence was sort of law. So this document that was supposed to address all the daily needs of those who take care of defense would only be known to the forces, uh, the security forces. So Senegal set up several sectoral strategies. So in this context, when you do this, you can add another sectoral strategy to the other existing sectoral strategies. It's only in 2018, uh, General Biranjo, who was chief of staff, uh, chief of cabinet to the president, we finally moved to another phase. Um, this added a dimension to this drafting of the document. As an advisor to the president, he 
led a thought process that brought about a strategy and he involved various stakeholders. The involvement of the highest authority of the state um, was really a, a break from the past. So this means that the president of the Republic who noted the diversity of the sectors gave guidelines for the drafting, the creation of this national security strategy. So the drafting of the strategy was born from this interest brought about by the president and taking it into account the stakes for Senegal. And that gave the leadership for the drafting of the strategy. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thank you very much, um, um, uh, Colonel Biagi. Um, uh, can you share as well the first step taken um, uh, when you started the, the, uh, the, the drafting of the national security strategy? So, as I was saying, the role of the president of the republic was clear in, in the drafting of the national security strategy. This is because in ordering the drafting of this strategy, um, he gave guidelines, strategic guidelines. The president gave these strategic guidelines to the entire government to participate in the drafting of the national security strategy. So the person who was responsible for the drafting of the strategy began the various phases. The first phase was the planning of the strategy. Why planning? Because planning is the core element of the process. It is important to define all the stages, all the phases of the process so that you can master any deadlines, uh, you can establish consultation, the work and integration of the work. So you have to mobilize the resources in order to, so that everyone can participate to have clear planning. So within this planning, Senegal, it, it began with a seminar on uh, national security strategy. And then we had sub-regional participation. And then, and then there was the producing of conceptual documents, a conceptual note, which is absolutely mandatory from the start because this conceptual note defines the objectives, the composition of every stakeholder, uh, every commission, every item of coordination, the secretariat. It establishes the role of everyone in the creation of the strategy. Now, within this dynamic, the position of the document that the person uh, responsible for this proposed a vision because before that we had objectives. Now we have an inclusive vision that allows us to embrace the interest, the security concerns of every sector within the state, uh, even in the most remote places in the country. Now, after the drafting of this vision, at the same time, there was the creation of the commission the creation of the budget, uh, reviewing the sectoral documents and establishing the terms of reference for the commission. So within the framework of this preparation, all these actions were taken into account uh, with the various participants that were appointed to participate in the drafting of the national security strategy. Now, at the second level, we have organization. First, the setting up of the organization, uh, the, the committee, because in the drafting, 
uh, to establish uh, the strategy, the person in charge had set up committees made up of individuals who had held high level positions, who knew the country well, who understood well defense issues, who understood the people of Senegal so that they could make sure that the orders of the head of state would be re respected. And then the establishment of commissions from the ministries in order to serve as a secretariat and as a monitoring body. The third phase was the analysis. Tasks were um, assigned to subcommissions. They did their work and then they recapped their work. But this was not sufficient. We went, we moved on to the next phase, which was consultation. Travel within the country in order to understand what were people's concerns so that everyone, even those who were in the opposition had interests towards security. Um, these, this travel was absolutely necessary because you have to understand the population and it engages them in the country's security. Senegal has 14 regions and every region has its own features, its own specific um, traditions, etc. So those who are in the most remote regions have not the same concerns as those who are in Dakar. So speaking to the people essentially frees up expression. They, they, these people are not used to being asked their opinion. So these public consultations were implemented and involved populations of various people, uh, civil society, trade unions, young people, women, all sectors of the population were consulted. Then there were interviews with resources in the region, be it religious leaders, uh, university uh, staff, defense forces. So these are the stages from the planning on that Senegal followed it to achieve the drafting of the strategy. We are now in the last phase, the essentially um, pooling together all of this and the drafting of the document will have to be approved in an overall meeting of all the commissions. It will then be pre presented to the president of the Republic. Uh, the, the, the second question, um, the government of Senegal designated chefs your institution to oversee the drafting of the strategy. Can you share with the participants the advantage of having such an institution to oversee the process of national security strategy development? If you can just uh, uh, briefly describe it, that would be, I would appreciate that one. Chats is not a ministerial organization. It is not within a ministry. So it actually has perspective in terms of the ministry's activities. So this choice has several advantages. Um, it is a service, it, it has personnel, staff are military and civilian. So they have a cross-cutting position that enables it to engage with all the ministerial departments. And it has all the necessary types of expertise. Chad does not have a political role. Its role is to respond to political expectations at the strategic level. So it has this technical capacity that enables it to not only organize things and monitor, but it can also monitor and evaluate the strategy. So it's a type of memory for the state. So the permanence of this organization enables it to evaluate 
what's happened and will be able to provide the elements that will permit an evaluation in the future of the strategy. Excellent. The, the last point, Colonel, is can you share with the participants some of the key challenges that you have encountered during the national security development uh, process and how did you manage to overcome site challenges? In the planning phase, Cheds had already identified a certain number of risks to the process. The first was slowness in the preparatory phases. And secondly, the uh, lateness in establishing a bud budget. And then the availability of the members of the commission. And then the lack of involvement from the people who were supposed to participate. So to avoid this, the person in charge establishes a strategy to mitigate risk. First, he set up a roadmap and uh, monitoring indicators. Then there is the creation and securing of the budget, and then the education of all the stakeholders in, in the process to draft uh, this document to, and to monitor this work. The person in charge uh, met with some difficulties that were already identified. First, uh, the problem was the mobilization of financial means. So at first, he used his own budget. But at a certain point, it became insufficient and the process stopped. But it's only because of the intervention of the President of the Republic that a budget was allocated to make it possible to continue with the process. So the importance of this cannot be understated. Then you have actually um, obtaining the loyalty of the members because many members of the commission were nominated, but they didn't finish. They were assigned to other tasks within ministries. Then you have the problem with technical expertise. So, uh, people who joined uh, the commission who were replaced. So there was a, a problem during the discussions because it took longer to debate and to arrive at consensus. And then the lack of resources. And then of course, COVID-19. Uh, this actually affected the process and we lost a lot of time. You know, we started in 2018. It's 2021 and we're still not finished. Well, thank you very much, uh, Colonel. That is excellent. And I believe the participants will learn a lot from the Senegalese experience. Thank you very much. Uh, let me now move to uh, our second panelist, the Gambian experience. Um, Ambassador Bradley, uh, you are uniquely in a better position because you practically managed to supervise the process of drafting national security strategy for Gambia. Uh, can you share with the participants who initiated the process and why leadership, leadership matters? Can you as well share the importance of national security strategy for the transitional as Zambia, Gambia was uh, passing through a very difficult transition and the methodology that you have adopted for the drafting? Uh, let me seize this opportunity to say good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. And as the security, national security advisor, I have been the technical lead of security sector reform. So I would like to share with you the formulation process of the Gambia's national security strategy. Actually, before I go, I think uh, I want to start with a small, I mean, a quick uh, uh, definition, which says, and I think that's my favorite, that national security strategy is the art of science of developing 
applying and coordinating instruments of national power and also to help in achieving the ends and protect and advance national interest. So basically, in other words, the instruments of national power are used to pursue the national interest. So that's an indication of how important a national security strategy is. To start with the legitimacy of the national security power, sorry, security strategy in the Gambia, the endorsement was done by no one other than His Excellency, the President, who promised the Gambians of economic, social, and moral renewal after the change of government. And I think most of you are already aware that although the Gambia did not go into post-conflict, but we had a difficult transition. And that I, mean, I want to thank my colleague, the Senegalese, for the support we received from them. So the formulation and the directive came from this excellency, the president. And also we had an assessment when we were doing or kickstarting the security sector reform. So the one of the findings and recommendations in the assessment report was to formulate and develop some important policies and strategies that were either non-existing or indeed obsolete. So this, I mean, national security strategy is one of them. Also in our constitution, there is a relevant clause that indicates and directed for the principal to be able to come up and direct, I mean, the security sectors. So basically, the government started the reform process by developing some preceding for policies. This very national security policy came from the national security policy, sorry, national security strategy was a product or was meant to be able to implement the uh, national security policy. So basically, the president traditionally signed the document and allowed the process to take off. And then he also, I mean, constituted the steering board, we call it the security sector reform steering committee, that is a strata below the National Security Council. The reason being is we wanted a mix from national and international partners. And if you look at this uh, SSR steering committee, it comprises of five key ministries, interior, defense, foreign affairs, finance, and justice. And it also includes the United Nations or UNDP, the EU, European, European Union and ECOWAS. They were included for, I mean, reasons. Because when the, we had a problem, the president, after proclaiming and desiring to reform the security, he had to approach the international partners for support. So basically, for the planning responsibility, the 
Office of the National Security was created, which currently I am heading. And then the National Security Council is also assigned with a responsibility. And then we were fortunate in the Gambia to have, I mean, a pool of international partners who were interested in supporting and helping us. So we formed what is called the International Advisory Group, which I chair in most cases. So in order to address the key issues that was defining our security, the planning process considered reform processes to include the democratic and also to ensure that we are able to follow rule of law as the document is going to be a supreme, I mean, document to under the national security policy. The functions also included to plan so that there are is principles of freedom and justice and ensure that democracy flourish. All these we are done because of the situation, the environment, the circumstance and the landscape. We all knew where we were uh, departing from and we wanted to ensure, especially the executive wanted to ensure that we don't return back. And then whatever strategy or policy that is put in place, it will be very, very, I mean, holistic, comprehensive, and very inclusive. So that, I mean, we learn our lessons and would never return to that. Okay. Also, the political issues were also on board. So the planning, I mean, team looked at how we would be able to ensure that the, the society is democratic and also the political and economic situation remain sta stable. We were aware during the planning process, having brought in some think tankers, sorry, think tank group, the first framework that we had prior to the drafting proper was to come up with some pillars. And what we identified in pillar one was the protection of our national sovereignty and territorial integrity. Pillar two obviously looked at good governance, respect for fundamental human rights and rule of law. This one is very key and always will be important to the current government of the Gambia and the people. Cooperation and collaboration among the institutions, because we found out that there were standalone institutions, the issue of oversight mechanism was not available. In that case, the, our intention was to ensure that the document really look at where there could be very, I mean, close collaboration between the institutions so that they can be able to, yeah. I mean, help each other and support each other. Okay. Patriot patriotism and nationalism, and to finally give our country a very positive image and prestige considering that the last regime had a fallout with the international community. And finally, as a poor country, the last pillar was to look at the economic, socioeconomic development of our country. So basically, we continued with the planning phases okay. and had some mapping of relevant stakeholders, starting from the Security Sector Reform Steering Committee, which is number two 
in the strata of coordination of both the reforms in terms of security sector and also looking at the strategy formulations. The yeah. chairman of the yes. yeah. Ambassador, I, I think, yeah, something very much. I think you have elaborated very well for question one, but let me, we want to move on and I would like you to highlight, I think you did a very good work on the uh, the importance of the security sector reform assessment exercise. I think it's one of the very important exercise that you conducted to guide the, uh, the national security strategy development in the Gambia. But can you just share briefly, because, uh, because of the time, the challenges that you have encountered during the, the process, and how did you manage to overcome those, those challenges? Just briefly, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Luca. The challenges we face is almost similar to that of, I mean, Senegal. Actually, our first challenge was the drafting, I mean, uh, drafters or the drafting committee. Actually, we selected the drafters from our own security institutions. Reasons being, we wanted to use the process as capacity building and also to be able to ensure that the, the processes that will follow, meaning the subordinate, the, uh, the subordinate uh, frameworks are done by the drafters. Coordination across the state and non-state across also was difficult because there was no democracy, we were having some problems. The problem of achieving consensus sometimes during the debate, because we were doing the security sector reform at a time when there were a lot of, I mean, issues when we needed reconciliation and healing. The COVID-19 obviously hit all countries and Gambia is not indeed an exception. So we have our own story to tell. Difficulty in prioritizing. You see, in order to achieve and plan well, you need to also prioritize your activities. But because of the situation, we were, it was difficult for us. And then to coordinate uh, international and partners' contribution was a, a difficulty. Initially, it was planned that the entry point will be the Office of the National Security. But then, you know diplomacy. Sometimes the ambassadors will come, the ministers of foreign countries will come. When they discuss at the level of presidency and foreign ministry, obviously, they, that sounds like entry point. Trying to find a balance between the security also, because, I mean, they were apart, and then, we will try to bring a complementarity between them, but it was difficult. Then the final one is budget. Up to today, the, there is no significant budget provided by the government. And budgeting is important in the security sector reform because there is an element or component called national or local ownership where the country has to demonstrate the ownership by also mobilizing and then uh, putting in some um, uh, resources. So these are basically the challenges. Yes, and then sir. the other issue I think uh, is the capacity. Remember we came where we came from and then we did not um, employ, I mean the drafters, but we took them from our institutions. They came raw but we try to address it with some uh, induction training and whatever, what a view which we did, I mean, to make sure that we improve their capacities before the actual drafting started. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. You really elaborated very well the challenges and uh, I thank you very much. I, I believe the, uh, the experience of the Gambia is quite uh, relevant to many countries and they, People will benefit from your case study. I refer again to all the uh, to the uh, to the participant. The case study of the Gambia is one of our our reference, the reading material for this uh, webinar. 
police uh, uh, work. Let me go now to the discussion, Dr. Fairley. Uh, Fairley, you have listened carefully to the two case studies and based on your elaborate and sort of review of the National Security Research Development Toolkit, uh, can you share with the participant the common faces uh, for the National Security Strategy Development Process and what are the key elements in the uh, in phase one uh, and phase two, especially phase one planning initiation and phase two pre-drafting assessment review and analysis. Uh, Dr. Feli, you are welcome. Thank you, Dr. Luca, and thank you to our panelists. What a, just fascinating to learn from your experiences going through this process. And I think maybe that's a, the best place to start. That wealth is one of the most important parts of a good strategy, a good policy. And the fact that our two panelists have um, really given us some insight into how much work is required to plan a good process before the first words even go on the paper. And, and that's really what the first two phases of really spent a lot of time talking through that process. So the first phase is, um, as Dr. Lucas said, what we call initiating and planning. And really this is, this is key. How the process starts will determine how it continues and, and whether it's successful. And what that really speaks to is the level of political buy-in to the project. And both the cases, both our panelists in, in Senegal and Gambia, both really underlined how important it was in both, in both processes to have really high level, the highest possible level of political support for the drafting of a national security strategy or policy. And that is because in so many of these cases, things won't get done unless the instructor coming from these issues seems like you um, And also because a, a national security strategy process that is inclusive, that, that, in, that covers more than just a narrow focus on military and defense issues, goes beyond to look at human security issues as we talked about in round one, that's a process that involves uh, internal security forces. It involves often um, um, that might go, it involves the justice sector, it will involve health and education and foreign affairs, the finance ministry, all of the government actors. If there's not support for that process and cooperation from the highest level, cooperation will be unlikely. Um, so that different ways that that can happen, it will depend on the context. It might come from the parliament, it might come from the president's office, it might be initiated by the prime minister, it might be a demand that is the result of a, of a broad social process as in some cases, but it needs to be supported at the highest political level. Um, and I think then um, why that happens is also really important. Obviously, there's different reasons why a national security strategy might be initiated. Sometimes it's to do with security team may face a internal security threat and the security sector isn't well placed to do that. Or it could be that there are internal political reasons um, to do with a transitional context such as the Gambia or to do with uh, other political issues or, or deficiencies or improvements to be made that might be go forward. We've heard again and again from our panelists about the importance of having um, really the people, the budget and the timeline figured out before getting started, before going any further. So really your time, what the time that's available falls and going too fast. You have to have the resources, both people are going to be involved in this project, um, the cost, it has to be planned and it can be secured up front, so budget secured up front shouldn't begin or should be replanned so that it fits the budget available because the chances of getting stalled later on are high and that can be um, in itself a dangerous thing. And then finally, there's the city in general. Human security is an enormous subject. There's so much to talk about and the conversation can go on for a very long time. That is not always helpful. 
people. So being really clear about the scope of the strategy and, and what will be involved in the drafting process up front at the beginning is really important. And those are kind of you know, on a high level, the basic elements of a good plan. Now, once that plan is in place, then you can move to what we call the second phase, which is the pre-drafting phase. And the pre-drafting phase is really when um, the people who are going to be responsible for drafting, for writing the national security strategy, have been put in place. They've been defined. They know who they are and they know what their job is as part of the planning process. And they really have three tasks. The first task is to look within and to understand what the state of the security sector is, what its capacities are currently, and, and really get a sense of, of where how things are at the moment. The second task is really to then look beyond what is going on um, in the security environment to conduct, for example, a threat assessment to understand what are the challenges that the country um, needs to respond to, that the security sector needs to respond to. Um, the goal being that you can understand the gap between current capacity and that will be essential later on when you come to uh, creating divisions of labour and prioritising. Um, um, it's a good idea to broaden the conversation. There will be a drafting committee and there will have been an initiation and planning process that is quite a small Bringing in more expertise is a really good idea at this stage. And there's more uh, it can bring up new information that might be useful. It can help bridge capacity gaps. It can um, surface expectations among the public about what the state or the security sector is or it should do. Um, it can also uh, sensitize the public to this fact and to what can be expected. And uh, the Colonel's example of how this was done in Senegal with the drafting committee visiting all 14 regions, it's a really good example of that. Um, so once all those elements are in place, this pre-drafting phase, once the drafting committee has everything in, that they need in place, that's the end of phase two. Dr. Luca? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Fairly. I think you elaborated very well. Um, maybe your connection is a bit a problem. Maybe if, if you have a problem, we can be able to, you can just, uh, um, uh, you can put off the um, the video, but that so far it's fine. The last question, maybe briefly, I think um, uh, Badji and Biagi, uh, they talk very much about the the challenges during the uh, these, these, two, these two phases. Just briefly, can you highlight some of the challenges encountered during these phases? Of course, because we have many case studies, it's not only uh, Senegal and Gambia. Just briefly, some of the, the challenges at these particular phases, so phase one and phase two. Uh, please, briefly. Sure. So um, one of the first process problems is the timing. Um, so a process that's too long is uh, not helpful. Uh, it means that uh, the security challenges or the security environment for the policy or the strategy may have changed. Um, and all of the work that's done in the early part of the process may become irrelevant simply because the context moves faster than the process. So uh, a process has to be planned in such a way that it's fast enough, rapid enough to remain relevant. Um, also because whilst planning is going on, that means that the security sector is left somewhat rudderless. Everybody knows that change is coming, but nobody knows yet what it's going to be. And that's a, that's a moment um, where people may struggle to, to use resources effectively and focus on their mission. So planning is important. Someone asked in the chat how long it usually takes. And of course, every situation is different. Cool. Me for understanding need to happen quite quickly. The next um, challenge with this is the challenge of the of a forced process. And we heard, for example, um, both in the case of Senegal, for example, how when the whole process changed, once there was high level buy-in um, by a particular Senegalese official. We heard in the Gambia about the challenges of managing um, external support to the process and the pressure that can sometimes come from external assistance. And this really can't be emphasized enough. At the very beginning of the process, it's just critical to make sure that level supports and, and institutions involved. 
pretty much because people will not act on <laughs> policies that they're not well involved in or that they, they don't approve of. It will help with implementation later if everybody understands what the process involves and is on the same page about why it's important, especially at the beginning, especially at the highest levels. And um, we heard how in the case of the Gambia, for example, there was a seminar that was established specifically for that purpose. And in Senegal, a concept note as a result of the seminar. Um, so that's a really good example of how to avoid that challenge. Um, and then I think um, a final a final challenge that that uh, also the case of both the case of Senegal and Gambia really really highlight um, how useful it is really held for example within military or defence institutions and um, the need to broaden that process and ensure that it is an inclusive process across um, all aspects of security providers. That's really important, and it's it's more difficult in some cases than others. Dr. Luca. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Freely. That's great. And um, I think I, I think you have done three of you. You have done a great job, and yeah, we are really very grateful.